Good day, everyone. Today, we're diving into a topic that's central to your journey as future teachers, understanding physical and motor development in infants and toddlers. We will cover also the physical and motor development among preschoolers, late childhood, and adolescence stage. As teachers, you'll be witnessing the amazing growth of children, both physically and cognitively. But what does it mean when we say a child is growing, and how can we recognize these signs? Let's get started. What are the indications that you're growing? Think about it for a moment. How do you know you're growing? Is it your height? Maybe your strength or stamina? Or perhaps, you notice changes in your abilities, like how fast you learn something new. Growth is more than just physical size, it's about how our bodies and skills develop. In infants and toddlers, this process is even more dramatic and rapid. In this stage, babies experience incredible changes. From being completely dependent on their caregivers to gradually learning to move, communicate, and explore their world. But there are certain patterns and trends in how this development occurs, and it's important for us to understand these trends as future educators. On the next slides, we have here physical and motor development. We'll focus on both physical and motor development. Physical development refers to the changes in body size, proportion, and overall structure. Motor development, on the other hand, is how children learn to control their bodies through movements, from basic reflexes to complex actions like walking and grasping. Understanding these aspects will help you support children's learning in meaningful ways. Now, let's look at two key trends that describe how infants grow, cephalocaudal and proximodistal trends. These trends tell us the general direction of growth in the body. Cephalocaudal refers to development from the head down, while proximodistal is about development from the center of the body outward. Let's break these down further. Cephalocaudal trend of development. Cephalocaudal growth means development starts at the top of the head and works its way down to the feet. This is why newborns can lift their heads before they can control their legs. The brain and the head are the first to grow and develop, and the rest of the body follows. You can think of this as the head-to-toe pattern. Also, during the first few months of life, the baby's head grows more than the body. This continues postnatally as well. The head is the command center, so it makes sense that it grows first. For example, have you noticed how infants learn to control their arms and upper body before they can walk? This is a clear example of cephalocaudal development in action. As infants grow, they gain control of their upper limbs first, this is why babies can reach for objects with their hands before they can kick or move their legs with the same coordination. Similarly, their brain and eyes develop faster than their jaws and other lower parts of the face. It's all part of that head-to-toe development. Now, let's shift to proximodistal development. This refers to growth that starts from the center of the body and moves outward. Think of it as inside-out growth. The spine and torso develop first, followed by the limbs, and finally the fingers and toes. This pattern ensures that the core is strong and stable before finer motor skills, like finger movements, emerge. From the fifth month of pregnancy until birth, the baby grows from the center outward. After birth, this pattern continues. For example, babies learn to control their trunk and arms before they master fine motor skills with their hands and fingers. You may have noticed how a baby's ability to move their body becomes more coordinated over time. Again, here's a simple illustration showing these growth patterns cephalocaudal from head to toe and proximodistal from the center outwards. You'll see these trends in action as you observe infants gaining control over their bodies in stages. Now, before we move forward, let me ask you something to really get you thinking. Which organ do you think develops first in a baby, the brain or the heart? Take a moment and reflect on it. Which do you think is more essential at the start of life? Again, the question is, which organ develops first? Is it the brain or the heart? This is an important question because the answer tells us a lot about how the body prioritizes its development. Think about it before we reveal the answer. The answer on this question is the heart. Surprising, isn't it? The heart is the first organ to develop. But why is that? Why the heart develops first? The heart is the first organ to form during development of the body. 
When an embryo is made up of only few cells, each cell can get nutrients it needs directly from its surroundings. But as the cells divide and multiply, it soon becomes impossible for nutrients to reach all the cells efficiently without help. The heart is crucial for circulating nutrients and oxygen to the developing cells. Early in development, cells can get nutrients directly from their surroundings, but as the embryo grows, it becomes too large for nutrients to reach all cells efficiently. The heart forms to ensure that every cell in the growing body gets the nutrients it needs. As the embryo grows, it also produces waste that needs to be removed. This is where the circulatory system, powered by the heart, comes in. It carries both nutrients and waste, keeping the embryo cells alive and healthy. That's why the heart is the first organ to form, it's the foundation of the entire body's survival. Next in our discussion is the growth rate of individual body organs. Now, let's talk about how different parts of the body grow. Not all body parts grow at the same rate. Just like how your head develops first, different organs in the body have their own unique growth rates, which will categorize into four trends. Growth Rate Trends Introduction The four trends in growth rates will cover our positive acceleration, negative acceleration, reversal growth, and the S-shaped curve. Let's take a closer look at each of them. Let's begin. Positive acceleration refers to slow growth in early childhood followed by a rapid increase during puberty. Think about how slowly a child's height increases in early years compared to the sudden growth spurt in adolescence. This is especially true for the genital organs, which grow rapidly during puberty after remaining relatively small in childhood. Negative acceleration is the opposite but in terms of development in negative acceleration, fast development at the beginning, which slows down over time. For example, the brain grows and develops rapidly during the first six years of life, reaching 90% of its adult size, but then growth slows considerably as children get older. Reversal growth is unique, and you see this in the lymphoid organs, like the tonsils and lymph nodes. These organs grow rapidly during childhood, but after reaching their peak, they actually shrink in size as we age. Last on our list is the S-shaped curve. It is the general pattern of growth for most parts of the body. It starts with rapid growth, followed by a slow phase, and ends with another rapid growth spurt. This is especially common during puberty, where we see that second phase of rapid growth. Now, while most children follow these normal growth patterns, there are cases where growth can deviate due to certain conditions. For instance, hyperpituitarism results in excessive growth hormone production, leading to giantism in children. In adults, this condition leads to acromegaly, where bones thicken and grow unusually large after growth plates have closed. Both conditions demonstrate the effects of abnormal growth. Here we see examples of giantism and dwarfism side by side. These pictures highlight how abnormal development can manifest in extreme cases. Giantism is the result of too much growth hormone, while dwarfism can occur due to a variety of factors, including genetic mutations or hormonal deficiencies. As future educators, it's crucial to recognize that each child grows differently, and some may require special attention or support. Let's return to typical physical development. In general, infants grow rapidly in both height and weight. For example, in the first five months, a baby's length increases by about 30%. That's almost one-third of their original size. When it comes to weight, infants usually triple their birth weight in the first year. However, this rapid pace slows down during the second year. This is why babies appear to grow so fast early on. Another important aspect of development is the brain. Did you know that at birth, a newborn's brain is already about 25% of its adult weight? That's a quarter of the way there. By the time a child turns two, their brain has grown to about 75% of its adult weight. Additionally, as I say a while ago by around 6 years old the brain is almost 90% its adult size. This rapid growth highlights how essential the early years are for cognitive development. However, if a child grows up in a depressed or neglected environment, brain activity can be significantly affected, resulting in developmental delays. Now let's move into motor development. In infants and toddlers, motor skills develop in a predictable pattern, starting with reflexes. These reflexes serve as survival mechanisms, automatic responses to stimuli. 
From there, children move from gross motor skills, like crawling and walking, to fine motor skills, such as grasping objects or holding a pencil. On our next slides, let's delve deeper about examples of newborn reflexes. So what exactly are these reflexes? Reflexes are automatic and involuntary responses to stimuli. For example, think of what happens when you accidentally touch something hot, your hand pulls back immediately. It's an instinctual, protective action. Babies are born with several reflexes that help them survive in their early stages of life. Let's break down some of the key reflexes newborns have. In this slide let's discuss and differentiate each of the newborn reflexes. Rooting reflex, when you touch a baby's cheek, they'll turn their head towards the touch and open their mouth. This helps the baby find their mother's breast or a bottle for feeding. Sucking reflex, this goes hand in hand with rooting. When something touches the roof of a baby's mouth, they automatically start sucking. This reflex allows them to feed effectively. Palmer grasping, if you place your finger in a baby's hand, they'll instinctively grip it. This grasp reflex is often one of the most heartwarming for new parents. Plantar or curling, similarly, when you touch the bottom of a baby's foot, their toes curl inward. Reflex is often one of the most heartwarming for new parents. Startle or moral reflex, if a baby is startled by a loud sound or sudden movement, they'll throw their arms out, arch their back, and then bring their arms back in. This is their natural response to feeling insecure or startled. Dollet reflex, when you stroke along the side of a baby's spine, they will curve towards the side you're touching. Walking slash stepping reflex, if you hold a baby upright and let their feet touch a surface, they'll make stepping motions as if they're trying to walk. Tonic neck reflex, fencing position, when a baby's head is turned to one side, the arm on that side stretches out while the opposite arm bends at the elbow, resembling a fencing position. These reflexes are important signs of healthy neurological development, and over time, they will be replaced by more voluntary and controlled movements. Here on these next slides are illustrations of these reflexes, kindly pause the video to better familiarize with each reflexes. While on this slide, it shows how we can check for early signs if our child is with or without physical development delay. Now, let's talk about gross motor skills. These are large body movements like lifting the head, rolling over, sitting, and eventually standing and walking. Gross motor development progresses from simple to more complex actions. On the other hand, fine motor skills involve smaller, more precise movements, like reaching, grasping, and manipulating objects. Initially, babies' movements are quite crude, they mostly move their shoulders and elbows. But as they develop, they gain control over their wrists, hands, and eventually, the coordination of their thumb and forefinger, which allows them to do things like pick up small objects. Next, let's discuss sensory and perceptual development. Did you know that a newborn's vision is 10 to 30 times weaker than an adult's? It's quite blurry at first, but it improves significantly over time. By as early as 7 to 9 months, a baby's vision has improved, and by their first birthday, it's close to that of an adult. This is also the reason why our babies cries at the sight of unfamiliar carers. They can already recognize better those who are their regular carers and those who are strangers to them. By the way we will further discuss this topic on attachment theory. As for hearing, this actually begins developing in the womb. Babies can hear their mother's heartbeat and voice, and even music while they're still in the uterus. This early auditory development is essential for language learning later on. Let's quickly recap the four growth rate trends we talked about earlier. Positive acceleration, slow growth followed by a rapid increase during puberty. Negative acceleration, rapid growth at first, then a slowdown, like the brain. Reversal growth, rapid growth followed by a decrease, as seen with lymphoid tissues. S-shaped curve, growth that starts fast, slows down, and then speeds up again, especially during puberty. We also discussed motor development, where infants progress from reflexes to gross motor skills like sitting and walking, and eventually to fine motor skills like grasping. This steady progression allows children to gain independence and explore their environment more actively. Finally, we looked at the reflexes newborns are born with, like rooting, sucking, grasping, and stepping. 
These automatic responses serve as survival mechanisms, ensuring that babies get the care and protection they need in their early months of life. To wrap up, understanding these physical and motor development stages is crucial for anyone working with young children. As future teachers, you'll need to recognize the typical developmental milestones so you can support your students and identify when something might need closer attention. Each child's growth is unique, and by knowing what to expect, you'll be better equipped to guide them through these early, formative years. On the next video I will discuss the physical development among preschoolers, late childhood, and the adolescence stage. Thank you, and I hope this lesson has given you valuable insight into the amazing process of human development.